welcome back to another edition of the Common Constitutionalist weekly podcast, and I am, as I always am, the Common Constitutionalist. I've got a few topics to discuss today, uh, a couple of real buttes. Uh, First one, um, inmates going out on strike. Yes, prison inmates are going on strike. Yep. Freedom of speech on college campuses is, well, we'll just say it's dead. And another little spoiled Hollywood actress uh, is claiming uh, oppression, claiming racism. It may or may not be true, but I doubt it. Today on the Common Constitution. You're listening to the Common Constitutionalist, broadcast from an undisclosed location, free from the prying eyes of establishment black helicopters. Okie dokie. Well, I don't know whether you knew or not, but I'm going to tell you that uh, September the 9th, which was Friday, was the 45th anniversary of the Attica prison riot and takeover by the prisoners of Attica prison. Prison. Attica. Attica. There was a, I see, I have kids, everybody who has kids has seen Spongebob. Uh, we've seen probably every episode ever made of Spongebob, certainly uh, certainly early on. And there was one episode where I don't know what was going on. I think uh, him and his, uh, his cohort, Squidward, were <laughs> going out on strike where they work at the Krusty Krab. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the people walked by and started chanting Attica, Attica. It's just funny it's just because it's an adult thing. And they throw some stuff in there the kids would never understand. It's kind of like the old Bugs Bunny cartoons. That's why they're still so funny, is that the, they, there's a lot of adult-ish type of humor that it's good for kids. The, the Bugs Bunny stuff is good for kids, but it's also great for adults because they get it too. But again, I digress. So this one, uh, this, <laughs> this, is, this is just, it's, man, I'll tell you, you just can't make this crap up. It's stranger than fiction. Who knew that prisoners could go, could strike, could go on on strike, and who knew that that they that they were un, that they were unionized, unionized prisoners? Now I've just only in America, yeah. Um, this uh, couple of pieces that come from the Nation uh, dot com, which is a commie uh, website. I mean, these people are as as left as they come. And it also uh, comes from a, uh, the attribution I'm going to give is from the a statement from the IWW, which is the International Workers of the World. Now, what do we know? What do conservatives all know? Workers of the World Unite type of thing. Anything that has anything to do with international workers of the world, workers of the world unite, anything that has to do with workers is Marxist communist. That's, that's what it is. But so this uh, this statement that was put out um, on the day of the of the nationwide <laughs> prison strike was put out by the IWW, which is the International Workers of the World, incarcerated. <laughs> I just you just can't make this crap up. Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. Are you freaking kidding me? The pr- prisoners have their own union. Give me a break. And here we are, the Walmart people are struggling against the union, and the, and the prisoners have one. So on Friday marked the beginning, the commencement of a nationwide 40 prisons in 24 states uh, walkout, uh, for want of a better term. You know, in prison, maybe you don't know in prison, I don't know personally, Thank heavens, but whatever. But that's 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 going to be coming soon. If Hillary or somebody gets elected, um, then we'll all be locked up, and we'll know all about this stuff. And maybe we could unite under the industrial workers of the world, and we could unionize because we're all going to be going to re-education camps. But any at any rate, so the IWW Incarcerated Workers Organiz- Organizing Committee stated on September the 9th, which was the kickoff to the uh, nationwide 
pri prison walkout. Where are they going to walk out to? I mean, it's not that they can go anywhere. But at any rate, it's, it says, a call to action against slavery in America. Here we go. It's the ticket. In one voice, rising from the cells of long-term solitary confinement, echoed in the dormitories and cell blocks from Virginia to Oregon, from sea to shining sea. It doesn't say that, but that's kind of what it evokes, at least. We, we, we prisoners, I just I can't even stand it. We prisoners across the United States vow to finally end slavery in 2016. Can I get a huzzah? On t <laughs> I can't even stand this, man. This is so absurd. On September 9th of 2016, we will begin an action to shut down prisons all across this country. We will not only demand the end to prison slavery, we will end it ourselves by ceasing to be slaves. Ain't that just something? So what's their beef? What's their bellyache? What's their problem? Of uh, the problem is, is that they are they maybe it's the fight for, <laughs> it's the fight for fifteen in prison or something. It's the same bloody types of organizations. What the heck's the difference? Their beef is apparently uh, people are getting locked up and they're being treated like slave and indentured slave labor and indentured service. They're not getting paid what they're <laughs> what they're worth, and that they're. You know, they're having to go out into the field and tend the fields and work the kitchens and do all this other stuff, and they're just not getting paid, or they're not getting paid enough, or they're having to work too long hours, or whatever. And they're just sick of it. They're tired of it. They can't. They're not taking it anymore. And so they're going to sit down, and they're going to strike. And this isn't the first time that this kind of crap has happened. It hasn't. It's not nationwide. It's this nationwide thing. They're going to strike why the why the Kaepernick iron is hot. I guess I don't know. But uh, the Nation reports that in 2013, um, up to 30,000 inmates engaged in a hunger strike across California's state facilities, forcing the hand of California Department of Corrections. We'll get to that and rehab rehabilitation and that. Uh, to reform long-term solitary confinement policies. All right, so 30,000 inmates are engaged in a hunger strike at the various California departments of corrections and rehabilitation. All right, now, first off, this corrections and rehabilitation stuff. Many moons ago, I was uh, I I I think I called in um, to uh, and spoke to Gordon Liddy uh, on the phone. Uh, G. Gordon Liddy of Watergate fame. Other than Mark Levin, the most I'm gonna guess the most brilliant legal mind I've ever spoken to. In any event, um, he he was shuffled off into I think it was nine different federal facilities, federal prisons, and they all. They all considered themselves federal correction uh, institutes, correctional institutes. And we had a, a laugh about that because I asked him about correctional institutes, and he went on to explain to me that uh, the, he actually got slapped about, I think, from what I understand, a few times for, acting, for asking one of the prison guards or several of the prison guards who exactly they corrected. What, <laughs> what are they doing? They're not doing anything. They're just watching the prisoners. They're not correcting anything. These facilities don't correct any. Well, no, excuse me. Let me correct myself because he did go on to say that what happens in these facilities is that they're very cliquish. Um, all the rapists will get together in, in, a, in a clique, in a group, and the robbers and the burglars and the murderers and, uh, you know, they, these, these, they break off into, into these, in these they like think tanks is what they are. And they get together, and they they correct their mistakes. <laughs> so this is the correctional facility part of the correctional facility, or the correcting part. They What they do is they discuss what they did wrong. So when they get out, if they get out, they cannot make the same mistake twice. There's your correction. Rehabilitation, not a chance. There was There are so few people that come out of prison rehabilitated, it ain't even funny. 
that's why the recidivism rate is off the charts for these guys. Is it? It's like a. It's like a freaking revolving door. They leave the prison. They go. They try and uh, pull the, pull the same type of job in a better way because they've been <laughs> corrected by the other prisoners in prison. And then they go back and they find that they're still still too stupid for that line of work. Uh, but they don't learn. They end up back in the clink again. Now, as far as prisoners striking. All right, this is just the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Uh, prisoners go on a hunger strike. Um, I don't want to be seem harsh or anything, but too effing bad. You want to go on a hunger strike, you don't want to eat, knock yourself out. Have a nice, we'll give you the cot, and we'll give you the cell, and if you don't want to eat, you don't have to eat. And if you starve to death, that one's on you, brother. Too freaking bad. That's just too bad for you. If you don't want to work and you don't want to eat, then that's too bad. You get what you get. You're in prison because you're in, because you did something. Uh, don't give me this crap about there are you know millions or hundreds of thousands of innocent people in prison. Every once in a blue freaking moon, you hear about somebody who is incarcerated um, incorrectly, and that is once in a blue, once every other blue moon. Now, one of the representatives of the uh, Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee is Malik Washington. He's an inmate at H.H. H. Cofield uh, Unit in Texas, and he's the chief, sp <laughs> chief spokesperson for the End Prison Slavery in Texas movement. And there's lots of these. There's the Free Alabama Movement and Free Ohio uh, Penitentiary Movement. And there's all of these things as free. What does free have to do with the prison? It's the opposite of free. Sorry, folks. But uh, Malik wrote a letter saying that prisoners in American prisons are sick. <laughs> this is, you can't make this stuff up. Are sick and, here, I'll, st I'll start this over again. I'm sorry. Prisoners in American prisons are sick and tired of being degraded, dehumanized, and exploited. Are they really? Well, I checked on old Malik Washington and uh, what he was sent up the river for. And he was sent up the river for, uh, he was arrested and convicted on two counts of aggravated robbery. All right. That ain't just give me your money, bub. That's aggravated robbery. Oh, and he was also convicted on one count of aggravated a kidnapping where he and two accomplices um, happened upon a woman at gunpoint. They took, they kidnapped this woman. Malik kidnapped this woman, forced her to drive to an APM, ATM, and with the gun in the back of her head, forced her to take her money out of the APM, ATM and give it to her. Thank heavens she didn't get hurt. She didn't get shot or killed. But uh, that's old Malik. And so he is tired of being, what did he say? A degraded, dehumanized, and exploited. Well, F you, Malik. Um, what did you think about that girl when you held the gun in her face and told her, uh, told you uh, to drive you to an ATM? Uh, well, she wasn't exploited, degraded, or dehumanized, huh? You sorry sack of crap. Now, one of the, uh, the complaints, and I'm running a little long on this segment, but at any rate, one of the complaints was that the, the prisons are actually, they, they rely on this slave labor, on prison labor. And of course they do, okay? Um, there's lots of free labor there. There's nothing else for these guys to do except for watch APO, a, uh, HBO and uh, work out all the time and, um, and sexually assault each other. But the uh, organizing committee complained that prisoners are forced to work for little or no pay. Pay? What? Do you, who, what? Pay? Screw your pay. Get to work. And they claim that this is slavery. But, of course, we know it's not. And they admitted, of course, after they say that that is slavery, then they quote the 13th Amendment to the Constitution that says you're not allowed to, uh, you're not allowed to own slaves or you're not allowed to uh, uh, um, force somebody into involuntary servitude, except for um, if you're p uh, being punished for a crime and convicted of a crime. Then, th then that's the exception to the rule. So a boo-hoo for you inmates. So if you all want to go on hunger strike and you all want to do work stoppages and whatnot and you don't want to have the food or you don't want to have anything, too bad. Too bad for you. 
of the guards just lock up the place. Um, you know, you know, put some f uh, 50 cal uh, machine guns around the around the perimeter, um, and uh, and and walk out and see how long you guys last in prison with no food and no facilities and no nothing because you're too because you're you're too proud to work, too freaking bad. Yeah, you know, what is the the uh, the can't do the if you can't do the time don't do the crime. Well, y'all did the crime, and stop your whining and get to work. Let's take a break. <laughs> You're listening to the common constitution. Let the truth be known. All right, welcome back. Now, I got to tell you, I feel, I feel really, really sorry for any individual, male, female, black, white, yellow, red, I don't care, pink with purple polka dots, any kid that's going off to college these days that isn't a complete politically correct weenie. I feel bad for all those normal kids that are heading off to college thinking that they are going to be taught how to think critically, how to think outside the box, how to uh, you know, the free speech and, and all this other stuff that college is supposed to be about, critical thinking and independent thinking and, and independent speech and being able to be safe to say whatever you want without fear of repercussion because that's what the college experience is supposed to be about. I mean, other than learning, you know. But any normal kid that shows up at... <laughs> Increasingly, almost any university or college, major, minor college, whatever it happens to be, is going to be, if they don't already know ahead of time, is going to be in for a rude awakening. Last week, I did an article about a college in California, Pomona College in California, in which throughout the dormitories, the student dormitories, uh, these kids were treated to posters basically saying that all whites are inherently racist. That's the first thing you need to learn is that all whites are racist and that you need to you need to acknowledge your racism, you need to acknowledge your white privilege, and you need to shut up and you need to listen to people of color, POCs as they call them. And then they had, they had a short, abbreviated list, and I'd hate to see the whole list, of words that you weren't supposed to say, like ghetto and sassy and riot, you're not allowed to say those things because it's a it's an oppressive word, it's a microaggressive word, and all this other just just politically correct, uh, offended, want to be offended, nonsensical thinking. It's just it's and it's it's plaguing uh, college uh, societies. It's just ridiculous. And now I read of another shining example of the 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 death of free speech on college campuses, the death the, the death of free and critical thought and speech on college campuses. This gem comes to us from the Daily Mail, my friends at the Daily Mail. Uh, this is from Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, and they have hired a new chief diversity officer. Cherie Marlowe, she's fabulous, and she is directing all the freshmen, all the new students. As a matter of fact, from what I understand, most uh, colleges and even high schools now, you can't even say freshman because it's degrading. I don't know whether you say first-year student or there, I'm sure there's some politically correct bullcrap term for it, but freshman is out. But she has um, she is directing students on how to avoid subtle insults known as microaggressions. The trained lawyer, of course, she's a trained lawyer. I wonder what kind of law. It couldn't be civil rights law, could it? No, of course not. She said that, uh, let's see, she is, oh, she is committed to promoting diversity. No, she's not. Equity and, ex and inclusion in higher education. And again, a no, she's not. Recently told freshmen at Clark University that they should avoid asking black students if they play basketball. 
So, okay, so you see this uh, this this black kid walking around with a basketball in his hand, okay? I don't care if he's black, white, or Chinese, or what. I don't give a rat's hoot what he is. Um, but if he happens to be black and he's t- and he's toting a basketball and he's six foot ten, you can't ask him whether he plays basketball. You can't ask him whether he's on the basketball on the Clark University basketball team. No, that's a microaggression. I mean, honestly. Oh, <laughs> and I did, I thought this was this was actually kind of funny. Um, they <laughs> they should also. This is this is classic stereotype. This is this is great stuff. They should also not badger your an Asian student they don't know for help help with their math homework. That is awesome. It's great stuff. And it's too bad for the Asian students because they're probably cleaning up in the tutoring department. So they're going <laughs> their paychecks are going to be uh, severely diminished by the fact that kids can't ask ask them to tutor them in math. Maybe they'll go, maybe the Asian students will go out on strike from slave labor. Like the maybe they'll join the International Workers of the World or something and go out, go out on strike. So they uh, they inserted a, a little report from the New York Times, of course, that the term microaggression was coined by Columbia professor Daryl Sue. Of course, Columbia. Who went to Columbia? Oh, that's right. Our dear president went to Columbia. And he's as much of a radical as Professor Daryl Sue. Uh, Daryl Sue refers to microaggression as the brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults and insults toward people of color. So only, but only people of color, because you can't insult a Caucasian. There's, it's impossible. You cannot, no matter what you call them, it's not an insult, it's not racism, it's not what they call reverse racism, as if that's a term. Because as we have been taught, and taught, and taught, and beaten over the head with it, only people of color can be oppressed. Only people of color uh, can be, uh, 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 can be uh, victims of racism. So she had 525 first-year students um, that was that were they were required to be there. Actually, it wasn't a voluntary thing. Although a lot of probably the weenie liberal students in Worcester, Massachusetts, were more than happy to go to the microaggression, microaggression council. And uh, Ms. Amarlo, the uh, no doubt civil rights lawyer, now churned uh, chief diversity officer at uh, Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, She asked the audience of these 525 captive first-year students to imagine what it feels like to see their race or gender not represented on a wall of fame. She cited the example. On your first day of class, you enter the chemistry building and all of the pictures on the wall are scientists who are white and male. If you're a female, or if you just don't identify as a white male today, yesterday, or whatever, that space automatically shows that you're not represented. Oh yes, that's exactly what it shows, right. So you should go off into a corner and whine, or better yet, you should file a civil rights lawsuit against Clark University for daring to put so many white male scientists up on the wall of fame. And then maybe instead of uh, striving to be the first, I don't know, black female scientist on the Clark University wall of fame, you can go into a, into your safe space and whine and cry while uh, Ms. Marlowe, on your behalf, files a federal lawsuit against Clark University. There you go. So this is, this is, this is, absolute totalitarianship this is this is what it is it's a totalitarian regime at clark university as well as many many other universities across this country and this is frankly if you know your history this is the way it happened uh at the turn of the last century the uh the into the 1900s the turn of the the first part of the 21st or 20th century 
when the Fabian Socialists were invited from Germany and they came over to Johns Hopkins University and they taught the progressives how to be progressive. And that's where we got the Woodrow Wilsons at Princeton University. And that's where we got all the other progressives like uh, FDR and all those other dirt balls. That's where that movement came out of. It came out of the university environment and we're repeating it again and again and again. And it's just getting worse. And a few, uh, a few other examples, uh, Rut Rutgers University in, uh, I think it's New Jersey, isn't it, um, have been advised to use language that is kind and necessary. This is they, uh, they're advising their students to use language that is kind and necessary and avoid, avoid offensive terms such as retarded and <laughs> that's so ghetto. That's just, and they are, they, they, they don't want to commit microaggressions because you'll have to run to your safe space and put your thumb in your mouth and curl up in a fetal position and, uh, and just shrivel up and die, apparently, because uh, uh, sticks and stones uh, don't break your bones, apparently, but words will harm you uh, in perpetuity. There you go. And it's just continuing to get worse and worse and worse. Last year, professors at the University of California. Here's Now, you're going to love this one. You love the last ones? This is even better. Last year, professors at the University of California were urged not to use a number of, you ready, of offensive phrases. You ready for the offensive phrases? Such as describing America as a melting pot or the land of opportunity. Those are offensive. Those are microaggressions. But America is not the land of opportunity. It's the land of, of, of oppression. It's the land of racism. It's the land of, or land of everything evil. America is the worst country on earth, except for every other freaking country on earth. But that's these spoiled, rotten, freaking brats that know nothing of real life. And I feel so bad for these students because they're being indoctrinated into this stuff and they don't have a choice. You shut up. You listen and you repeat back exactly what you what we tell you to repeat back. You don't use the words that we don't tell you to use or we tell you not to use. It's just oh, it just rips me to no end. So I think on that note, I am going to end this. I am not going to get through the weeny little uh, Hollywood wingnut. Uh, this girl who went into a, uh, a a store or something like that and tried to says she tried to buy some gift cards. <clears throat> and the clerk was so racist, uh, claiming that she, uh, because of her skin color, uh, they she refused to sell her four hundred dollars worth of gift cards. And we don't know because it's just her word against the stores. Now, of course, the store apologized because they're in California, so they're politically correct to begin with, and they don't want any bad press from this little Hollywood weenie, uh, Zendaya or whatever, some teenage wingnut. I think she worked at the Disney Channel or Nickelodeon or something like that, and now she thinks uh, her, she's all that in a bag of chips or something. I don't know. But at any rate, I've had enough. I'm hot under the collar, and I think uh, I think we're just going <laughs> to I think we're going to call it a day. So you all have a great balance of the weekend. Be safe. I'm out. Thank you for listening to the Common Constitutionalist Weekly Podcast.